Okay, let's learn one last technique here for feature selection. Although I, I hesitate to call it feature selection because it's also um, uh, principal components analysis. It's also a form of uh, feature engineering. We're actually going to create new features out of existing features using this pill. Uh, let's, I'm going to drop the permutation feature importance pill. Um, we learned this in a prior chapter. If you're taking this in, depending on which class of mine you're taking this in, you may have learned this already in a prior chapter. But I need to assume briefly here that you haven't, so this fits for a couple classes. Let's uh, grab this pill, Principal Components Analysis, and we're going to put it back up where Feature Importance, Permutation fe no, sorry, where Filter-Based Feature Selection went. So let me define or describe what's happening here. In fact, let's see if uh, we've got some good, if um, Azure's documentation gives us something useful. I'm looking for a particular type of video, or a excuse me, an image. Let's go to Google Images and PCA uh, Principal Component Analysis. There we go. So PCA is a technique for uh, taking multiple variables and deriving new variables out of it. It could be that you have 11 variables like we do, and we want to crunch that down. We And out of those 11 variables, let's say we have several of them that are highly correlated, like income and age, income and education. Well, what we've done previously is we've deleted variables that are that are too highly correlated because they end up not being very useful. Like we might have gotten rid of um, income or age because it was too highly correlated with another variable and it didn't add a lot of value because of that. Well, that's not bad. However, age still does give some advantage. If you remember from our Excel chart, let me pull that back up. And our charts right here age however small it still offered some predictive value but we got rid of it because we were worried about overfitting well what if we could take age along with the variable that it was highly correlated with like income and generate a new variable that represents both so we don't lose the variance that's uh, offered by age um, altogether PCA is one way of trying to accomplish that. What it does is it says, okay, let's plot these variables along a graph. And let's see if I can find a good one. So here's here's a scatter plot of, and this in this case, it's really only two variables. Actually, here's something even more complicated. That's nice, but too complicated. Let's go with this one. There we go. So here we've got a clear direction of this scatter plot of variable one. Uh, but also, there's a direction going this way, too, because you can see the dots tend to fan out here in the middle before getting smaller or closer together down on this end. So if we could turn these two variables into one, two that are angled differently that describe the flow of the, of the dots better, then that could be a more accurate representation of the data. Now, this is just two variables. Sometimes we have to plot a ton of variables so here's another one. Um, ignore these actual labels. Here's where we've got multiple components or um, uh, factors that are coming out to describe all of these. Maybe here's, uh, here's another one with three variables. And uh, we might draw, yeah, there could be several components we could draw out of that. I don't have the time to get into either the math, although here's a good one on the math. <laughs> or the details too much, but I'll provide an extra video that goes through the details of PCA uh, if you want to understand how it's working. But essentially, what you need to understand for this class is simply that it's a technique for taking many variables and recombining them into a smaller set of more orthogonal variables. What do I mean by orthogonal, by the way? Down here, uh, oh, where did that go again? Right here or here. These two variables are opposites of each other. We like highly independent variables. That's one of the assumptions of a multiple linear regression is that the independent variables are independent. And these two variables have two entirely different directions. That means they're more independent from each other. So PCA, yeah, takes a larger set of variables and crunches it down into a smaller set of orthogonal or independent variables. All we have to do is say, which variables do you want to include in this? Well, uh, let's go ahead and um, oh, by the way, it only is going to work here with uh, numeric variables. So our select columns, actually, no, I take that back. Hold on one, one moment. Let's make sure we put everything back in here. 
uh, we took out in our previous video. Uh, homeowner, occupation, education, and age. Oh, and gender. Do I have anything repeated? Um, I don't want to have anything repeated. Participate numeric, marital status numeric, numeric education. Oh, I've got, I'll stick with the numeric version. Occupation, education, age, region. Okay, I think we're good there. Okay, and then here, uh, launch column selector. I think it's going to want me to first run this one. Let's do, oh, I can't though, because this has to have at least something in it. So what I'm going to do is just stick uh, age in there for now, just so it gets rid of the little red exclamation point. What, you don't see age? There we go. Oh, here we got my whole list. Let's do this. Marital status, numeric, gender, income, children, uh, sure, commute distance. I can't remember if I, <laughs> which one I had now. Commute distance, numeric, cars, that age, homeowner. Uh, I don't want, oh no, I still need purchase by, is this my select call? No, it's not. I don't want my dependent variable in there. Just my independent variable. So I'll leave purchase bike numeric out of there. Region, uh, commute distance, homeowner, occupation. Is that all of them? Let's see, I might have messed things up here. The number of dimensions to reduce to. This is where I say, how many lines do you want me to try and draw through this data set? Well, the hard thing is, is I don't know. I can't visualize a scatter plot of eight, nine, 10, 11 dimensions and have a decent idea of how many lines belong there. So this is where I've got to just experiment. So let's start with just two. And I think I may have, I got, I might have a mismatch. Commute distance numeric, uh, we don't, we'll find out. Let's just get to this point and run the PCA. Run to this point. Okay, yeah, I did give a mismatch. Um, it's not finding commute distance numeric. I must have off, yep, commute distance. Let's replace that out for numeric. That's fine. Okay, so now let's go ahead and run this thing all the way down. Okay, let's uh, take a look first at, sorry, at the PCA. We get two things, the results data set and the PCA transformation. I first want to show you, actually, no, I can't, just results data set. We're going to visualize that one. Let's show you what this did. So, oh, did I forget to put education in there? All right, but I'll put that in, in a second. I got my two columns. I told it draw two lines through all those variables, but I just forgot to add education to it. And so what it does is it says, all right, if I were to draw two lines through a nine dimensional scatter plot, then what's the score of each data point on both of those lines? Meaning how close is it to this line and how close is it to that line? That's what I'm getting right here is uh, for the, for all those data points, not including education, which I forgot, which I'll fix in a second. How close is it to the line for column one and how close is it to the line for column two? So it goes through and plots each of those. And then I have, these are my two new variables now, column one and column two. So let's fix that for education uh, by coming back in here. I just have to add that to my list by name, add education over, sorry about that. Let's run this once more. And while that's running, what I wanna do is work on our Excel spreadsheet, which is what you're gonna use for your homework. And what does it want us to include here? It says, all right, for our principal components analysis, try at least three models with varying number of numbers of factors. Document the importance of each factor based on the model uh, using either the train model weights or the permutation feature importance weights. Uh, so I'm gonna have to add that in there. Then the R squared and RMSC of each model. Okay, cool. So let's come back here. Let's say, uh, we let's try up to, usually I'm not gonna do more factors than, than I had variables, but let's try, um, uh, column one through, let's go up to maybe, I don't know, eight. We'll try various combinations. So this is going to be the training weight for column one and two. Then our next model, let's run like four. And then our last model, let's run up to eight. And we'll put those scores right there. Then here we'll put R squared and RMSE. All right. Let's bold those guys. Let's see if this is done. All right, perfect. Let's take a look at the results data set first. So we've got purchase by numeric and then column one and column two. As you can see, adding education didn't change a whole lot, but it sure changed probably some of the decimals here at the very end. 
Anyway, now let's go and take a look at the results. So if we boil all of them down to two factors only, that does a terrible job of explaining what's going on. It's the worst R squared we've had yet. That tells me that there's a lot more than two dimensions in this data. Whoops, I forgot my R and a C. We always go ahead and document, document, document. And in real life, you might document all of these, not just the two that I'm doing to keep things simple. Depends on what your project manager wants or what you decide is important. Let's clear formats. Let's go back to numbers. Perfect. I guess I could probably do that for all of them, huh? All right. Let's see what our factors were for column one and column two. Uh, now I've got train model here. I'm okay using this uh, because it's just comparing two numeric fields. However, I could go back and put in a PCA. Yeah, that might be actually more, uh, not a PCA, sorry, a permutation feature important, importance, just to see exactly how important those two factors were. Not that I'm gonna, um, so I'm not using it exactly the same way as I did in the last video, but this will work. Let's go ahead and do that, one, two, three, four. We're running off of a coefficient of determination. Let's run that one more time. Oh wait, no, yeah, it's going to run the whole model. Okay, that's done. Let's take a look at these. Visualize. Okay, column two was clearly hurting. Or sorry, column one and column two only helped a little bit. So that explains our super low uh, R squared score. Let's put that on there. Paste that across. All right, let's go up. Let's uh, try four columns now. Or sorry, not columns. Factors is what we actually should be calling these. So same fields, up to two factors though. Let's see how this goes. Okay, let's take a look now. I'm gonna go straight to evaluate model. Uh, looking better, but still not as good as what we had before. That's fine. Let's go to uh, R squared, RMSC, and let's go back to permutation feature importance. Let's grab those scores. Column, and maybe it's going to be faster to do this. No, it was not. Let's try it now. You know, it still didn't help. Okay, that was a nice try. Uh, back here, column three. Four, two, one, but that's negative. Come on, I'll just have to add it in. Negative that. Okay, let's uh, paste this across. So uh, let's see, column one is still hurting that factor right there. Let's do one more with eight and then um, We'll, we'll call it quits after that. So PCA is going to be hit and miss when used in this way. Uh, while this is running, let's talk about it. Um, where PCA really is useful is when you have data with a lot of uh, fields that are intentionally correlated, highly correlated. What would that be? Well, in this data set, yeah, some of these fields are correlated, but if you remember back from the bivariate statistics chapter when we ran our correlation matrix, none of them are really highly correlated. And by that I mean, I don't know, above 0.9 or 0.95 or below 0.9 or 0.95. So when you have data that's not super highly correlated, a PCA is usually not going to be particularly useful. However, let's say you do a survey. It's very common with survey data to use three or four questions to measure the same thing but from slightly different angles. So for example, if you want to measure customer satisfaction, you might have one question that says, how satisfied are you with this product? Another question that says, how likely are you to refer this product to a friend or family member? Uh, would you buy this product again? Those are all very similar questions to, to customer satisfaction. In that case, I would use a PCA and it would, it would merge those, those questions together into one dimension. I do that often when I, I have a, there's standard surveys measuring personality and culture. There's five dimensions of personality and six dimensions of culture. And I often measure those in the same survey with five questions measuring each dimension. So that's a total of 11 factors, 55 questions. So I'll use a PCA and say, merge, shrink this down to 11 factors. And it, each of those questions will then load 
on the factor that it's intended to load on. I can extract 11 factors out of that survey data. Um, and then PCA performs really well in improving the R-squared value. So anyway, uh, a good survey analysis class will teach you PCA in a lot more detail. However, it's useful to get the basic idea right here and have this available as a tool. You don't need to know it perfectly to be able to just use this pill and try it out. So anyway, here's our eight factors. Uh, let's put this in here, R squared. We never quite got above our original results, did we? It never got great. Um, for speed's sake, I am just going to grab these. Well, I better resort them. We can do that. I don't know why this didn't work before. Let's try it again. Paste, special. I might do just text only. Sometimes that fixes it. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. Okay, let's uh, sort this by um, column A. There we go. All right, perfect. So that means I can now, I've got these in order. Copy, home, paste, transpose. Right there. Perfect. All right, let's, um, let's format these to all be the same. I'm going to use that style. There we go. All right, I'm at the end of this assignment, in the end of this chapter. Here's what I want to do next. Uh, let's examine each of these and see where we got the best R squared. We've got a 10.43 here by just straight up using the top nine factors based on either mutual information or chi squared. We got uh, a bit better here. Actually, with was it with all of them? Yeah, it was with all of them. Um, using permutation feature importance to select the top variables, but then eliminate those with negative scores, and then further reduce my likelihood of overfitting by eliminating a few more. And then I've got PCA. I never got above 9.95%. However, to be fair, sometimes you can extract more columns than you have variables. And I might want to keep trying in this case, try 9, 10, and see at what point it stops going up before I really say that uh, I'm not sure PCA is the best one yet. So for your assignment, you're going to find your best R squared. We're gonna, you're going to save this document as is. Uh, come back here to your assignment. You are going to uh, upload your file right here. Enter your top R squared right there. Tell me how hard you thought this was and submit and you're done for this chapter.